Welcome to Algorithms Explained. In this video, we're going to be learning about computational complexity. We'll start by defining what computational complexity is. Essentially, what this means is with an algorithm, given some input data of size n, how long will it take for the algorithm or function to run on that data? In other words, how does the number of computations that the algorithm is going to do scale with the size of the input data, which is of length n? We'll start with a simple example to look at what this means. What if we have an algorithm whose purpose is to count the number of a particular letter in a string of letters? So how would that algorithm work, and what would its complexity be based on the size of the input array? Well, in this case, let's start with an input of hello, and let's say we're trying to count the letter E. Well, how many operations do we have to do for that? Well, we kind of have to start by looking at the first letter. Is that an E? No. Look at the second letter. Is that an E? Yes. So we have one E there. We still have to look at the next letter, the next letter, and so on. So basically, for this problem, we have to look at every single element in the input data structure one time. So how many operations did we end up doing there? One, two, three, four, five, six, because there were six characters in the input. We had to look at every single one to count them up. So if we happen to be given a longer input string, such as this one, well, how many operations is this going to take? We'd still have to look through every single element to count up all the E's. So we'd go one, here's an E, we'd have to count through all those, there's an E, here's another one, and the total count would be three, but the number of operations we had to do to carry out that task was equal to the length of the whole input sequence. So in this case, the computational complexity of this task would be called linear in the input size N because we are doing one operation for every single thing in the input. Now it should also be noted that the runtime of an algorithm can also vary depending on how the data passed in is actually structured as well. So it doesn't necessarily just depend on the size of the input, it can also depend on how that input is organized. So to give an example of that, what if we considered a different algorithm where we were just trying to determine whether a string has a D in it? Well, to start off with, we just start from the beginning of the data structure and go until we find a D. And if we don't see a D at all, then we can just return that there isn't a D. So let's do that on this first input data, data daft. Well, we'll check the first thing. Oh, there's a D there right away. So we don't even have to check the rest of this. All we're concerned about is if there's any D, we saw one right away, we could say yes, there is an exit. So we only had to do one operation in that case, even though the input data was of length eight. But now let's consider this case. We're going to run the same operation, so we want to check if there's a D, but there isn't a D at the beginning. The data just happens to be structured differently. So in this case, we'd have to check, oh, no D, no D. We'd have to go all the way to the end to discover, oh, there is a D, but we had to check everything before that before we can say there is a D and exit. So in this case, the exact same operation or the exact same algorithm would have had to do all of these operations to get to the end. Instead of just seeing it at the beginning and exiting, we would have had to go through everything to find it. So in the first case, we only had to do one operation. And in this case, we had to do n operations. And now we can consider a final example. Maybe there's a D somewhere in the middle. It's not that likely, perhaps, that there's a D at the beginning or the very end, but maybe there's a D somewhere in the middle and we'd have to check through perhaps half of the array or so before we can find something and exit. So in this case, maybe the runtime is n divided by two if it appears about in the middle. So what we've shown here is that algorithms can have different runtimes, and we often think of these in terms of the best case runtime. So in this, for this algorithm, the best case was we find it right away and exit. Well, there's also the worst case. Sometimes we have to search the entire array to find it. And maybe if it's not there at all, we'd still have to search the whole thing just to determine that it's not there. And perhaps when it's in the middle, we could consider this being something of an average case. It's not quite the worst. It's not quite the best. It's somewhere in the middle. When dealing with questions of computational complexity, we tend to want to focus on the worst case scenario. 
Basically, it's good to be prepared for the eventuality that an algorithm will hit its worst case scenario, because in some cases, the worst case might mean the algorithm is, runs too long to be practical to use, even if the best case or average case is pretty good. So just know that when people are talking about the computational complexity of algorithms, they're generally referring to worst case scenarios or upper bounds on the runtime. And that's what we will be dealing with for the rest of this video. When talking about computational complexity, it's useful to have a kind of shorthand or language to denote different types of complexity classes or orders of complexity. So something that's been developed to that end is known as big O notation. This is basically a way to quickly write what the complexity of an algorithm is going to be. So what it does is it describes the growth behavior or order of a function. And what it looks like is this, a big O and then something in parentheses, which is usually something based on the input size N of the data. So in this example, big O of N means that you're going to have to do N operations, something on the order of N. So it grows with the input size N. In this case, O of N is considered linear because for every new thing in the input or data, you have to do one additional operation. So the intent of complexity analysis and big O notation is to put an upper bound on the time complexity of an algorithm. We're not generally interested in counting up the actual precise number of steps that a particular given implementation of an algorithm is going to run because oftentimes it's not going to be exactly n steps. You might have a few extra things outside of the main function that are going to add additional steps. We're not interested in counting up those sorts of precise numbers. We're just interested in classifying an algorithm within several general complexity classes so that we can get a good rough estimate as to how long or complex the algorithm is. So now we're going to go through and examine the range of common time complexities for different algorithms and give examples of each one. So we're going to start from the fastest or the best and work our way toward things that are slower or have more operations. So you can see on this plot here, we have a Y axis, which is the number of computations that are going to happen and an X axis that is the input size of an array N. So the best time complexity you can have for an algorithm is what's known as constant time. A constant time algorithm is one where the runtime doesn't actually depend on the size of the input. For example, think of looking up the first item in a list. If we have a list like this that's of length three, what do we have to do to look up the first item? Well, we just look at the first thing one and return it. We didn't care that it was length three, we just got the first thing. So if we had this sequence as well, well, how long does it take to look up the first item? Well, it still only takes one step. We look at the first thing, then we return it. We don't care about the fact that there's more than 10 items in the second array. We're still only doing one thing. So the next best thing after constant time is an algorithm that runs in logarithmic time. With logarithmic time operations, also known as O of log N, we have runtime that grows, but it grows slower than the input size. An example of this is binary search. Think of a dictionary and looking up a certain word in the dictionary. Do you have to search through every single word in order to find what you're looking for? No, you don't have to do that. You can do what's known as a binary search. You can open up the dictionary halfway through, check to see what word you flipped to, and then you can know whether the word you're looking for is either in the first half of the dictionary or the second half based on the fact that the, you know the dictionary is sorted. And then you can do the same thing with that new half of the dictionary, and you can keep doing that, having the search space with each successive iteration until you find the word. And it turns out that this sort of logarithmic operation where you're able to have the size of the problem with every iteration is quite fast. It's not quite as good as constant time, but, but it's pretty much always something we're going to be able to run in a reasonable amount of time on a computer. After logarithmic time comes algorithms that run in linear time complexity. 
A linear time algorithm, also known as an O of N algorithm, is one where the runtime grows at the same rate as the input. We already saw one example of that earlier. Another example would be searching through an unsorted list. Say we were given a dictionary, but it wasn't in alphabetical order. Now we have to look up a given word. Well, that's a problem. We can't do our same binary search from before because we can't use the fact that it's sorted to figure out which half to look in. That means we do have to go through every single word in the whole unsorted dictionary to find the one that we're looking for. So somewhat worse than linear time complexity are algorithms that run in so-called log linear time. A function that runs in the order of log linear is O of n times log n. What that means is you have to perform an operation of log n complexity for every single input value n. So basically we have to do something log n n times. This might sound pretty bad, like that's going to take a long time, and it is worse than a linear operation, but it's still something that computers can generally handle and deal with relatively large size input data. For example, the most efficient sorting algorithms that there are run in n log n time complexity. So while it's not super fast, it's usually something we can deal with. After log linear, we're getting into algorithms that can be pretty slow if you have a decent size input. The next worst class of algorithms are those that run in quadratic time. A quadratic function, also known as O of n squared, is one where an operation of complexity O of n is carried out for every single input. So basically you're doing something that requires O of n operations n times. An example of this would be checking all the possible pairwise combinations of input values. So for instance, in coding, if you had a double for loop, we we're going over all the items in an array, and then for each of those items, you go over all the items again to find the various pairs. That would be something that would be a quadratic complexity algorithm. And beyond quadratic time, you can have other algorithms that run in polynomial times that are greater than squared. So polynomial time complexity algorithms describe anything of quadratic complexity or worse, generally worse because if it's quadratic, we just call it quadratic, but we can have things that have larger exponents than to the second power. So if you have something that's on the order of n cubed, that would be a polynomial of order three, and you can have things that are even worse than that, for instance, to the fourth, to the fifth, etc. An example of a polynomial algorithm, or a cubic one in this example, is to check all the triplets of a given input. In this case, we might use a triple for loop in code to do that. Now, even worse than polynomial runtimes are algorithms that run in exponential time. An exponential runtime algorithm, often called O of two to the N, although the two could be something different depending on how quickly the exponential grows, is a algorithm where the complexity is multiplied with each additional input value. So basically that means if the input size is increased by one, the computations required to carry out the algorithm are doubled, tripled, etc., based on whatever the number that's being raised to the power of n is. So if it's O of two to the n, just adding one more value to the input means you're gonna have to do twice as many operations. That means with exponential algorithms, the complexity grows incredibly quickly with the input size, which means that problems, even with fairly small inputs of say 100, might become computationally intractable, which means they're just not possible to do in a reasonable amount of time using modern hardware. Examples of exponential runtime algorithms include various recursive algorithms where you're breaking up a problem into a subproblem that's only one smaller than the problem you're dealing with, and then that's in turn broken up into two smaller subproblems, and those are broken up, etc., down into some base case. Another very common type of problem that has an exponential runtime is the traveling salesman problem. So basically, if you say have 
have a delivery truck and it needs to deliver to a hundred different locations that you know where they are, well, what's the optimal route to deliver to all those places and return home in the shortest amount of distance traveled? It turns out that is actually a very difficult computational problem that has exponential runtime. Finally, we can have algorithms that run even slower than exponential time. For instance, you could have an algorithm that runs on O of n factorial, or essentially n to the n power. Examples of algorithms that might do this are something where you're trying to go through every single permutation of an input. It is perhaps also worth noting that it's possible to have algorithms that have infinite runtime, at least in the worst case. This could happen perhaps as a result of just an error in code where you have a loop that never exits. That's a pretty common bug to have when you're writing computer code. But even that aside, there can be algorithms where the theoretical worst case scenario is an algorithm that runs forever. For instance, even something simple that statistically wouldn't be expected to run forever can have a theoretical infinite worst case scenario in terms of runtime. For instance, something Something as simple as flipping a coin until you see a heads, well, that's something that statistically we know is going to happen after not too many flips, but theoretically, that's an algorithm that could run forever. What if you just happen to keep getting tails forever? Like, theoretically, that's possible, even though statistically it's not. It's also important to note that an input data structure could have multiple input dimensions. This is particularly relevant for data science applications where you're often reading in data in tabular formats that have multiple dimensions. So if you get data in that form, you basically have an input that has two dimensions that may be of different sizes, which are often denoted as size N and M. And then the computational complexity of algorithms that you're running on the data may depend on both dimensions in some way. So for instance, we might have an algorithm that runs in O of M times N complexity because we don't just have N, we have a different dimension. So in this case, O of M times N could be thought of something similar to quadratic because it's similar to N times N, but it might not be depending on how different the two dimensions are. Maybe N is a lot smaller than M, so the practical runtime is actually less than quadratic. Examples of these sorts of algorithms are things run on two-dimensional data. Essentially, various operations you might run on a matrix or a data frame in a language like Python or R. Finally, we'll discuss some of the implications that the time complexity of algorithms has on how we think about designing and running computation. First of all, code implementation can actually have a large practical impact due to computational complexity. For instance, if you design a fairly naive brute force solution to an algorithm, maybe you come up with something that runs in quadratic time, but maybe the optimal solution, if you made your code in a smarter way, would be not quadratic, maybe it'd be linear or something like that. And that could result in huge savings in terms of run times, and that results in a lot of savings in terms of cost, because if you don't need to rent computer compute time for as long, that could be a big win in terms of savings for a company even. Now that also means that analyzing the runtime of code and refactoring, basically going back and improving code, can be very useful in terms of increasing efficiency. On the other hand, complexity theory tells us that some problems are just hard problems and are essentially going to be computationally intractable no matter what you do. So maybe you can solve a traveling salesman problem for fairly small inputs, but if the input size gets pretty large, that might just not be something that's possible to solve optimally in a reasonable amount of time. Now, there are some other considerations to keep in mind when thinking about computational complexity. First, it's important to draw a distinction between the 
practical versus the theoretical implications of complexity. Just because a certain algorithm has a really bad theoretical worst case runtime, like exponential, that might not practically be a problem if you don't need to run the algorithm on large input sizes. Maybe you know you'll just never run your algorithm on sizes bigger than like 50, and maybe an exponential runtime algorithm is something you can deal with because you're not dealing with very large inputs. Another thing to keep in mind is that sometimes suboptimal solutions, also known as heuristics, may be good enough to solve your problem in the way you need to. Sometimes you don't actually need to find the optimal solution and something that's close will serve your purposes. Another point is that better technology always helps. Today, we're able to deal with problems that have a lot more computational complexity than ones that we could deal with in the past, just by virtue of the fact that our computers are way more powerful now. They have a lot more computing power and we can do parallel computing with many different cores. So that allows us to tackle problems that are practically much bigger and more complex than we could in the past, even though the actual theoretical complexity hasn't improved and our ability to code solutions to them hasn't really improved. And one final point is that in addition to computational complexity, algorithms also have a memory complexity. So basically, how much actual computer memory or RAM do you have to use up while running the program based on the size of the input data? Just because something doesn't have a high computational complexity, that doesn't mean it's something you can necessarily do if it requires too much memory. Well, I hope this video provided a good overview of computational complexity. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.